Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Friday evening, 10 to 6, Tom Swarbrick on LBC means one thing, that there's a whole new box fresh hour of this programme to enjoy. See it as the radio equivalent of that first weekend drink, tie off, top button undone, we march towards the weekend from six o'clock. But at this time, nothing shall happen, none shall pass before Simon Marks, American Week. Tom, I am still on the road tonight in New Delhi, where I've spent another week watching America's drama unfold from afar. And to think they lecture us about how to handle protests, observed one of my Indian interlocutors here this week as she glanced at a TV showing armed riot police smashing their way into Hamilton Hall on the campus of Columbia University in New York. <laughs> To get into the academic building, police drove a massive motorised ladder through the streets of Manhattan. And as it arrived on West 116th Street, <laughs> protesters and onlookers vented their fury at what, to any dispassionate observer, looked like a pretty heavy-handed militarised response to the occupation of the building. America has not witnessed scenes like these since the 1960s, when protests against the Vietnam War brought universities to a standstill from coast to coast. But then you didn't have America's siloed media channels on air and online providing breathless live commentary. It looks like they're going into Hamilton Hall, which is the building that the students uh, literally took over late last night around midnight. This is a very dangerous operation. They don't know what's on the other side and how radical some of these students might be. Sean Hannity on Fox News stirring things up. Let them go! Let them go! Let them go! As demonstrators were being zip-tied and taken away by the police, supporters began calling for their immediate release and their reinstatement as Columbia students. Their key card IDs had all been disabled, meaning that they were also banned from accessing their halls of residence. Marie Adele Grosso, one of the detained students, talked to Ben Kentish here on LBC. Our school made the decision to send in the NYPD for the first time since the 60s to arrest us and told the NYPD what charges to give us. But there's a good chance that the district attorney of um, New York will drop these charges because they are not legitimate. She insisted in that interview with Ben that the protests had been entirely non-violent, which is not entirely true. 30% of the protesters arrested on Tuesday night were not affiliated with Columbia University in any way. At City College in New York, scene of another protest, 60% of those people arrested had nothing to do with the institution. Those those numbers support Columbia's contention that the protests were fueled by outsiders who had no legal right to be on the university's property and were determined to vandalize it and cause trouble. The university's beleaguered president called the police in, saying she feared for the safety of students with every right to be on the campus. There has been violence every single day. Eliana Jolkovsky is a student at UCLA on the other side of the country in Los Angeles. Like Columbia, it has been a hotbed of protest and she told Fox News that Jewish students on the campus were terrified by what they were encountering. My close friend Lonnie, she was physically assaulted multiple times. She was pushed off a ledge for holding a sign condemning Hamas. Um, and I've seen chants of them, um, you know, in a circle chanting intifada. And that's a call for violence against Jews. And to be chanting that in the middle of um, a campus, it just does not belong in an academic environment. This crowd became agitated after police breached the encampment. They are releasing, as you can hear, flashbangs every few seconds. NBC Radio Steve Patterson at UCLA as police moved in there at 3 a.m. on Thursday. 210 people were arrested, including some faculty members, and we've seen lecturers in many places joining the campus demonstrations and risking their careers. Now, none of this is binary. There were pro-Israel protests at UCLA in which participants turned violent, beating up some of the pro-Palestinian demonstrators. And to be clear, the universities themselves have questions to answer because at several institutions, negotiations with students did find compromises over the demonstrators' central demand that the universities divest from Israel and stop doing business with any companies that trade with it.
it. Throughout our history, we've often faced moments like this because we are a big, diverse, free-thinking and freedom-loving nation. Yesterday, after days of silence, the president weighed in. It's against the law when violence occurs. Destroying property is not a peaceful protest. It's against the law. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. Threatening people, intimidating people, instilling fear in people is not peaceful protest. It's against the law. Dissent said Joe Biden is essential to democracy but must never give rise to violence. That speech, like his previous efforts to thread the needle, appears to have pleased no one. Left-wing Democrats backing the demonstrators argue he simply gave the green light for more heavy-handed police action. Republicans say he continues to pussyfoot around the need to provide additional protection for Jewish students and supporters of Israel. The speech has also raised questions about the president's plan to give the graduation address at Morehouse College in Georgia later this month, where students and faculty members are demanding direct engagement with him over his handling of the crisis in Gaza. It is important to understand uh, why these protesters are out there. They are out there because they are outraged by what the Israeli government is now doing in Gaza. Left-wing firebrand Senator Bernie Sanders putting fresh pressure on the White House this week. They are out there for the right reasons, to protest U.S. continued military aid and money to a right-wing extremist Netanyahu government which is in a destructive war against the Palestinian people. He spoke on CNN in a separate newspaper interview. He expressed his fear that young voters don't understand the threat presented to American democracy this November by Donald Trump. And there's the rub. At the moment, the country is not having that conversation. And for it to occur, Joe Biden needs the protests to end and the imagery of a country in crisis to disappear. One image in particular this week may find its way into Trump's campaign advertisements. A statue of George Washington, America's founding father, at the university named after him in the nation's capital. Protesters covered his face with a Palestinian scarf, draped him in a Palestinian flag and defaced the statue with graffiti. While all of that was going on, another American icon was being remembered this week, a man whose death gives us a chance to look back on his legacy. The unmistakable twang of Dwayne Eddy and his guitar. He died this week at the age of 86 after having been diagnosed with cancer. He was entirely self-taught. He picked up a guitar at the age of five and basically never put it down. And he developed that keynote sound partly to reflect the region in which he grew up. The American Southwest with its vast expanses of deserts and highways, canyons and arid heat. He sold millions of records in the 50s and 60s, including Rebel Rouser that you're hearing in the background now and 40 Miles of Bad Road. And he owed it all to the medium of radio. My dad worked, uh, he was the manager of Safeway and a local disc jockey came in and he got talking to him and told him I played guitar and he said, bring him out to the station, we'll make a, a tape. I went out and I played a Chet Atkins song and he played it on the morning, his morning show and uh, went home in the afternoon and this country singer, a local country singer called me up and said, uh, we'd like you to work the VFW with us on Saturday night. And he says, it pays $15. I said, okay. Those were the days. He was a Grammy Award winning chart topper in an era in which instrumentals could still get people to race to the record shops. He was once asked to identify his greatest contribution to music. He responded, Tom, by saying, not singing. From Washington, D.C., bopping along, Simon Marks, American Week.